Hello and welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Ocean TV that looks at current events and new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I am Kevin Wilt. And tonight, or rather for this episode, it's our special Oscar podcast. It's fresh off the Oscars. We just saw the winners. Tonight on a very oh, special Streamers and Punches. Exactly. Exactly. Sit around the campfire with your parents, kids. It's really... You're going you're gonna to want to talk a lot about this episode after it's over. <laughs> um, actually, maybe. I don't know. But probably not. Anyway, so we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But we did just see that, and we'll share our thoughts and feelings with all of that. Um, speaking of Oscars and other awards in general, um, there are some cool concerts coming up. So specifically, there was an Oscar concert recently, and we'll have the link and some more information at our website. But it was a cool concert for the first time ever that featured music by, of course, Thomas Newman and Stephen uh, Price and John Williams and the other composers escape me for the moment. Of course, this is what our whole show is about, so that is very extremely professional of me. But Well done. <laughs> to cut to the chase, it did feature all of the music or, well, Displa was another one. Uh, that it featured the music from the Oscar-nominated scores. So that was cool that they actually kind of put the event on to um, basically shine more light on it and give a little more exposure. Very cool. Um, and then there's also going to be one for the um, the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences as well. We'll sponsor a concert, and that will feature the music from Game of Thrones and Downton Abbey, House of Cards, and a few others. So, we'll, uh, again, we'll have the links to those. Uh, at our website, and you can check that out at soundnotion.tv slash SAP. Um, Kevin, you found out about some uh, other concerts going on? Yeah, um, a couple things that that were kind of announced this week, uh, I suppose. Um, Ennio Morricone is doing concerts in New York and L.A. where he's conducting um, presumably his own film music, which, which is uh, kind of cool. And then just last week, there was a big announcement from the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, which of course is... Um, my my hometown band, but Bill, your the the the, Still. the orchestra in your neck of the woods. Um, they've announced that they're doing a, a, a fundraising concert gala thing in June on June fourteenth, I believe, uh, with John Williams conducting his music. But the kicker is that this event will be emceed by uh, Steven Spielberg, which very cool. I know. Well, I saw John Williams, He's the director, a, right? Yeah, he's he's a, he's a filmmaker. He has made okay. he's made motion pictures in the past. Did he make um, uh, he made that uh, Star Wars right? No, um, nineteen forty one. Always some of his best hits. Yeah, Color Purple. Color Purple was another another one of his big ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I saw John Williams conduct a, a a concert with the Detroit Symphony a couple of years ago, um, but certainly having Spielberg show up for this kind of elevates the whole thing. Uh, I'm sure it'll tickets go on sale. I think some point in April, and I'm sure they'll go quickly. So that's kind of cool. Um, we've mentioned uh, a couple of times in the in the couple of years we've been doing this show, um, sort of touring performances of various combinations of Howard Shore's music to the Lord of the Rings. Um, right when, right around the time I think Return of the King came out, they started doing tours of. Uh, what Howard Shore called his Lord of the Rings symphony, which is basically a giant two hour six movement suite of film cues. Um, but more recently there have been concerts of ba- really the live score to these Lord of the Rings films. Um, so the whole film accompanied live by an orchestra and chorus. And, and very recently there was a performance of this type of return of the King in Australia. Um, so we've got a review for that up on our website. It's, it's interesting to to see that those concerts are still kind of kicking around. But um, and as we've mentioned or talked about on past episodes, this format of accompanying a film with a live score seems to be more of a more and more of a common thing. Um, not only with touring shows like this, but um, actually like established symphony orchestras are doing this kind of thing, which which. I think it's really cool. If if I want to hear a, an orchestra play a concert of film music, I think I would rather see this kind of format than just, you know, a suite from Star Wars and the overture from Lawrence of Arabia and just a mishmash of theme stuff. 
When Kevin, do you know if when they do this, is it uh, basically they play the movie with dialogue and sound effects? So you go for a movie experience, and then they play all the music to accompany it, and just they have removed the score, and then just provide it live? Or it's, is it like a two-hour, three-hour music video with just music and visual? Yeah, you know what? I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know. It's, I mean, it is the whole movie, and it's the score being played along with the movie exactly as, as you would imagine it. But whether the other audio is there or not, I'm not sure. That's a good question. I mean, I know that. Okay, so Williams did an ET a couple years back for uh, for ET's. I don't know. Twin. That was, that was yeah, the big twentieth anniversary shindig. Two thousand two, then I guess. Okay, eighty two. Yep. Um, and that was that was uh, the there was a movie experience. So you had the the yeah, it was missing right. the music, and he just added it in live. So okay, and if you buy the DVD, you can actually watch the film with the live score, which is kind of cool. Right, it's and a little one, bit rough, as you yeah. might imagine, but yeah. It's cool. You know, and it was funny because some of the orchestrations, which are the same from the original, you know, more or less, yeah. they some of them don't sound good when they're not tweaked. They sound like um, it sounds like a Broadway orchestra, like over doublings, yeah. particularly in the woodwinds. Which, which I mean, I love Williams, but that's some that's always been a weak spot of of his for for my money is oh those whatever woodwind players often call like a flow bonnet passage, flute, oboe, clarinet. <laughs> well, that, it's it's like all three but yeah. on the exact same unison line or a run and it's 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 kind of like you've used up all your great imagination and you have nothing left for the woodwind runs right. so you write a flow bonnet passage or something yeah. but anyway uh, speaking of williams though um there was a nice uh, spot that abc news ran with diane sawyer john williams was the person of the week um well i mean depends on if you think he didn't win the oscars so he's no longer the person of the week but Anyway, just highlighted that he was yet again up for, I believe, the 49th um, nomination. Yep. And he is therefore now, and has been, I believe, for at least, I want to say, five years, the um, the living person with the most Oscar nominations. So, yes. um, so he continues to be that. Anyway, it was a nice little bit, and it does kind of show how... Um, he just describes a little bit about the discipline that goes on behind it, but he ends up for diehard fans. It, it's not too much new that you wouldn't have seen him say before, but anyway, it was, it was kind of cool. Um, and Kevin, you found something where the, uh, the CEO of Sony chimed in on the entire sort of saga, uh, the drama, yeah. Bruce Broughton and yeah. the song rejection since we're still talking about Oscars. Yeah. Since- our, our 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 last two episodes it feels like we've been talking about this for a long time this whole situation with um alone yet not alone the the fifth nominated song for or uh, yeah song for for best oscar for oscar for best song um uh, composed by Bruce Broughton um and how it was disqualified shortly after the nomination and and, and we talk we've been talking about that a lot this is kind of the last thing that I, I think to add is the yeah the CEO of Sony um, came out and and said that um, he feels that the the rules for the category should change. That in the case of a song of a situation like this, where uh, a film that was nominated loses its nomination, then whoever was next in line should be kind of upgraded to to fill that place. That when when alone yet not alone was disqualified, there should have been a fifth song put into that category. Um, I, you know what, I, you're just when, speechless. When, when it, when it comes down to it, it really seems like that's what this whole thing was about. And, and we've, we talked about this on the last show that so much of what seemed to be happening with this was that there were, there were other films that did, you know, more marketing and publicity and things to try and get their song nominated. And then they got beat out by this small film. Um, so I, it's, I'm kind of glad that they, they didn't put another song into that category because I have a feeling that's exactly what, what was driving a lot of this. And so to some extent, somebody didn't get their way in this whole mess and that, I don't know. I wonder if the CEO had a song in mind that he feels should have, I, it wouldn't, that's kind of what I was that's kind of what I was thinking when I when I read this article, which of course we'll have up on our website at um, soundnotion.tv/sap. 
Uh, that was that was kind of my thought. That I don't think this was this was a a general comment for the category. I I think this this person probably had a song that they had in mind from one of their films that they shot thought should have been in the category, and and wasn't. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we'll talk more about the Oscars in just a moment. Uh, but first, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what I've been listening to this week. Um, not nearly as much as I would like to be enjoying, but I did catch uh, the first two episodes of Sherlock. Or it's in its uh, third season, or as they like to say, series three on BBC. Um, so I've seen the first two movies because they're all an hour and a half, and they're usually fantastic. Anyway, I've enjoyed the the first two quite a bit. And uh, along with that enjoyment also is uh, the score, which I do like quite a bit. Uh, again, the theme is provided by David Arnold, and the score music is provided, or the episodic musical underscore is provided by our very own Michael Price, friend of the show. And um, is thank you, Michael, for a wonderful score. Is is that really how it breaks down? That that one of them did the theme and the other one does the underscore? I didn't realize that, that was the situation. I thought they both kind of did a lot of it. I well, I don't know the specifics, but I mean, when we spoke with him, it sounded like did he actually come out and say directly what the the role? I don't, I, I don't think so. I know I that know. When there's a uh, like a movie composer associated with a TV show, and Danny Elfman's done this that they go in like Simpsons, like yeah. he wrote he wrote the theme, and then he's out and he's got to go back to work on movies, and then they bring in Alf Clausen who just scores the orchestra every single week for the ap- actual episodic thing. But then a situation like Bear McCreary is different because he'll do the theme and then all the episodes uh, for like six shows at once or whatever the hell he's – that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy talk. Busy, he's, busiest man in the show, Biz. Bear yeah, McCreary. exactly. Yeah. He's, a, he's a busy bear. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So, is that what you call him, Bill? No. I was just trying to make a play on – anyway, some like, on a motto – never mind, alliteration, whatever. Something like so, that. So um, – yeah. So anyway, that was I, you know maybe I just assumed that, and so maybe we don't know. Maybe Michael could chime I, back. I I thought the way I understood it, and again maybe I'm misremembering and just have no idea what I'm talking about. I thought it was more they both kind of contribute. I don't know. It, well, it might be. It might be. But anyway, I have enjoyed that very much. Uh, Kevin, have you been seeing anything and listening to anything lately? Um, you know, just a uh, a couple days ago, I, I finally got my copy of uh, the soundtrack for Tim Tim's Vermeer, which is a score we've talked about a bunch by Conrad Pope, who we had on the show not too long ago. Yeah, um, it's you know that it's been that score has been racking up a lot of awards, um, particularly a lot of score you know best score for documentary um, at a lot of different awards things. But it's it's been very very. Um, it's it been a very well regarded score and and so i've listened to it a couple of times since i got my copy and it is really it's really fantastic music um it's it's a fairly it's a fairly eclectic score so stylistically it's kind of all over the place um but yet it manages to stay very unified so it's really it's really really kind of it's interesting i i highly recommend it i'm very excited because um, this film was just released in New York and L.A. Maybe I think maybe back in January or something like that. Okay. Um, and it's coming to where I am in South Florida. It's coming here this Friday. So I'm very excited to go see it. Um, but, yeah, I highly recommend it. It's it's it. Yeah, it's just it's very well crafted. It has a, a, a wide variety of really interesting stuff going on. Um, and it's it's nice because you, it's. Would you say it's thematic based or textural yes. or? It's no, it's it's. There are a couple of of very identifiable themes. Um, for I, I think we've maybe mentioned this on the show before. Uh, for for those of you out there that don't know anything about this film, it's a documentary um, about a guy named Tim, who is basically trying to recreate. Um, a Vermeer style painting through various methods of um, mirrors and photographs and, and, and things. So it basically he's asking the question of how is it Vermeer, this Baroque Dutch painter was able to paint such photorealistic paintings. Um, and, and so he kind of tries to do it too. 
Uh, and so the 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 time period difference between Vermeer and Tim, who is alive right now, of course, is several centuries. Uh, and it, that's kind of an interesting juxtaposition that um, Mr. Pope does in the score because for Vermeer's music, sometimes it has kind of a very Baroque, contrapuntal kind of flavor. And for Tim's music, sometimes it's just a very like jazzy trio kind of thing. And then there's a lot of stuff in between. Um, it's okay. The other thing I like about it is it's not, you know, the vast majority of film scores we get are these big, bombastic, huge orchestra things. This one's much more int- intimate, small kind of chamber groups for most tracks. Um, yeah, this is really nice stuff. I would highly, highly encourage our, our viewers to go check it out. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I want to talk briefly about some new releases coming out. Um, there's some really good stuff or just noteworthy stuff and some expanded stuff and some brand new stuff. So, for example, uh, there's a, a, a Peabody and Mr. Sherman uh, anime. For, um, I grew up with the old cartoon. Uh, if anybody knows it, it is very fun and clever. I am not planning on seeing this movie. But anyway, Danny Elfman uh, is, has provided the score. And it's out, or I actually, I believe, will be out uh, very soon. Mm-hmm. There is like a double album of uh, Roswell um, m- put together on the same album as another film called Communion, both of a kind of alien invasion topic. Um, the first part was a uh, score by Elliot Goldenthal, and the second part a score by Eric Clapton, no less. So that's available. Uh, the Blue Max is a classic score by Jerry Goldsmith. Um, it's out in a two-CD version. And I'm I'm pretty sure it's been remastered as well. Uh, Sherlock Series 3 that I had mentioned already by a combination of David Arnold and Michael Price is out. The Matrix Revolutions, a two-CD version with the music by Don Davis, is going to be available. Uh, for the first time ever, the Goodwill Hunting score, which is one of my personal favorites of Elfman's, will be out, um, I believe, actually, maybe in the next week. Uh, week. It should be out in March. Uh, and then uh, Star Trek. That one had never been released before? There was a song album with about two... With just a couple of tracks on it. Two cues. You know, the infamous... Right, right. Here's yeah. a song um, soundtrack uh, of the album. Here's a main title. Here's something else. And yep. that's that's it. I don't even know if that had the main title, but I know it had... Yeah, maybe it did have the main title and maybe like one other track. And yeah, yeah and then the other one like that is Phenomenon by Thomas Newman. And I, I would like to get that full score uh, rather than... a. a shoddy sounding bootleg but yeah. um well we'll just keep our fingers crossed for that but anyway uh so goodwill hunting will be out in march and star trek the next generation um a couple episodes that were scored by dennis mccarthy are going to be out um specifically encounter at far point which was the the it's the pilot the, right that was the pilot yeah in, in two parts and then arsenal freedom which escapes me at the moment which one that was about but anyway i just feel like and the nerd alert is on Full volume because I remembered Encounter at Farpoint was yeah. the first two episodes. Anyway, you remember the um, the title of a pilot episode of a show from just about thirty years ago. That's yeah, but I, I will have to say great. that was back when uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation was once it got through its first two seasons. Was to actually, be fair, Bill is by far the oldest person on the show <laughs> <laughs> by by uh, a pretty good stretch. Yeah, by at yeah. least three or four years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, but that was back when like show uh, titles, like episode titles were good, they were memorable, and they often were included at the beginning of each episode. Whereas like now, so you mean the- not 9am to 10:59am or whatever? That's not a good episode title like in 24. Right, right. <laughs> no, I don't I don't know. No, I don't <laughs> really watch 24. Anyway, um yeah. I did want to give one quick um, addendum uh, that uh, I did. Uh, I, I picked up a few of the new ones that I mentioned a, a few episodes back. And one of the ones called um, it's a Jerry Goldsmith score from a television miniseries from, I think, 1972 called uh, QB7. And the Q and the B are uh, the Q and the B are followed by Roman numerals, VII. And basically what it refers to is a courtroom case. It's a courtroom drama, but it was. Uh, very fascinating to read about the story, about the original, what what the film is um, essentially based on true events that happened to be um, a, a, a doctor um, 
sort of escapes from a concentration camp and so does another victim and the victim later sees the doctor in another country and claims that that he uh he did bad things during the the um occupation and anyway so there's sort of a courtroom drama that ensues but the music that goldsmith wrote is just it's just well it's it's just it's great memorable music it's well orchestrated it's it's a lot of variety, stylistic. Uh, stylistically, it's very rich. Uh, melodically, harmonically, it's good. Classic Goldsmith um, in the '70s, and if you like that sound of his, it's a great score. Anyway, so that that was there, and then uh, yeah. So I just wanted to follow up on that. So I mentioned these, and then some of them I have a chance to listen to, and that one I did, and I kind of loved it. So there you go. Um, okay, Oscars, Kevin. I feel yes. like quoting uh, Darth Vader. You were right. Tell I was right. Sister. I was two for two. You were right. I was two okay. for two. Although to be fair, I think both of us had basically predicted both of those. Yeah, I don't. I don't think either of these were. Um, they weren't were black. To they weren't. They weren't black sheep, or I guess uh, dark horses. I, I suppose right? we should talk talk about explain what we're actually talking about, and that is um, the two the, the two Oscar winners for mu- the music categories: the best original song and best uh, original score. Um, best song went to Let It Go from Frozen by Robert Lopez and Kristen Anderson Lopez. And best score went to Gravity by Stephen Price, who uh, – and both of those I think were the ones we picked. We predicted a couple of, of shows ago. Um, but like I said, just to show that um, these – they is it fair to call these safe bets? I think these are pretty safe bets. Um yeah. I found an and article here that there were. Uh, we're not going to rhyme either, like they did at the Oscars. So yeah, we'll that was share our listening audience. That that was really adorable. Um, yeah. Anyway, you know, how did you sound uh, like you were holding down your dinner when you said adorable just it, now? Uh, yeah. Well, it did it make like, me throw up a tiny bit. Anyway, it was like two musical theater majors took over the Oscars. What Oscar. are you talking about? Explain to the people what you're talking about. Well. The two winners for Frozen got up and they read all their names, but they made them rhyme. And Kevin, I think, hurled a little bit when he heard that. Just, just a tiny bit. It was, it was just, just a little, mouth. like in the back yeah, of your just throat. a little bit in my mouth. It was just a little too cute for their own good, and and way, way too too planned out for their own good. Anyway, and then um, she almost cried near the end as she talked about that, that part. That part's fine. I don't have a problem with that part. Um, but I, I say I say I say that these were safe bets, um, in part because well I think they kind of were. I also found an article that we'll have up on the website. Um, it said um, this particular website interviewed or, or asked the opinions of twenty nine Oscar excerpt uh, experts uh, who they thought would win for best original score. Twenty eight out of the twenty nine picked Stephen Price for Gravity. So like I said. It, not a super surprising pick. Oh, but who was the who was the one out? What did they pick? They picked um, Alexander Desplat's score oh. for Philomena. Thomas Newman, I'm so sorry. You should have won this. Yeah. But see, it's, I was, it's, I was realizing Gravity was sweeping everything halfway through. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So anyway, congratulations to the winners. We can stop talking about yes. Oscars now, which will be kind of nice. Right, right, right. So yeah, congrats to all. Uh, good job. And yes, Frozen and the Let It Go has been sticking in my head ever since one of my music theory students started talking about how she likes it. So I can't get the damn tune out of my head. And it just sounds like it is perfectly Disney in every way and yep. whatever. But anyway. That's what you so, would expect. Yep. Yeah. So I we've like- got this uh, a couple of interesting topics that have kind of shown up on, on um, social media the last couple of days from – composer Facebook friends of ours. And they're in a lot of ways, they're kind of related, but, but independent things, but it brings up an interesting discussion. Um, Bill, why don't you talk about the, the first one and I'll talk about the second one here. Uh, yeah, well, uh, Scott Glasgow, a friend of the show and a uh, fellow, uh, busy working composer in Los Angeles. Um, he read a review of the new Hercules movie, that was directed by Rennie Harlan and has a score by, and I, I'm sure I can't say this correctly, but uh, Tomas or, or a, a version of Thomas, uh, Cantalinen, Cantalinen, 
Tomas Kantelinen, uh, who's been working with Rennie Harlan on a few previous projects. So therefore, it was not a first-time composer-director relationship where you probably want to tread safe waters so that you deliver everything they want and, and it's all very familiar. It was more like he could play in a sandbox. But then the Hercules movie had a very large budget, so they could really go all out. And what the um, article, which was um, um, a critique written by James Southall, what he started noting was that there are some cool original stuff because he knows of the uh, music that uh, Cantalanen has composed from previous films. But then all of a sudden it's as if he just sort of tossed most of that out the window or a lot of it and started writing in kind of a, a very Hans Zimmer or to be even more generic, a kind of a remote control, which is the name of Hans Zimmer's composing house with him and several other composers, all composing in what is a, basically the same style, uh, that after a certain point, Cantalini kind of threw out his originality in favor of this sort of Herculean Zimmer remote control sound. Mm -hmm. So then what Scott did was then he just sort of put a link on Facebook and said, yeah, so um, just to paraphrase, he's saying, why do composers, when they're finally given a chance and they have a big budget, and, and this is not the situation of I want to put dinner on my table at home tonight, so I better write and only give like ultra familiar. I, I'm in a situation where I do have some creative freedom, but then why? And, do I and just, some resources to do it. Yeah, and some yeah, and budget and resources and a director who will back you. Yeah. Why then do you sort of then cop out to the use of cliches and something that just sounds like Hans Zimmer? So yeah. it is. I mean, it's it's not the first time this has been brought up, and and it's been talked about in various other forms, citing other films along the way. But anyway, but it is maybe good to to get it back out in the open. Um, and there are you know many ways to look at it. I mean, right away, it's like I don't know. It could have been an agreement on their part. Like you'll have some of your sound, and then some of this maybe was a temp track, and maybe was or or was an agreement between the director and the composer, or it was both. Or maybe the composer said, hey, you know, I've been doing my thing. I actually do want to use – I want to make my version of that remote control sound uh, because maybe I want other jobs in the future and I want them to know that I'm capable of what is being applied to several movies these days. I don't know. There, it, there's several several possibilities yeah. of yeah. why. The other thing that, that popped up on Facebook that, again, is was separate but still kind of unrelated is um, – or, or still or kind of related, I should say. Related, yeah. Um, Hummy Mann, who is a longtime film composer, orchestrator, arranger, um, composed scores for some of the later Mel Brooks movies, which is awesome. Um, uh, he's done, uh, like I said, he's orchestrated a lot of things. Uh, but he's also arguably, I think, one of the most important teachers of film music. Uh, he started... A, a summer film scoring program up in the Pacific Northwest a couple up a couple of years ago, excuse me, that has since rolled into or evolved into um, a film music master's degree. Uh, so so really, you know, uh, a big advocate, not only uh, being a composer but as, as a teacher as well. And brought up this point on Facebook that has had a, a huge response in terms of its comments and conversations. Uh, he basically brought up the point that he was talking with someone in the industry, I think it was an agent or somebody like that, who had commented him on his music being very melodic. Um, but then they followed that compliment up by saying, but, you know, unfortunately, no, no one is no one's looking for a melodic score. Um, and, and again, that was followed up by this huge conversation of well over 400 comments amongst all sorts of different people. Um, but many of the comments, that eventually, my, my, the point I'm getting to is that the conversation started being steered in, in the same kind of direction as what you had just mentioned, Bill, with, with Scott's comment in that everyone is looking for that Hans Zimmer ambient textural kind of thing and not – not something melodic. And, and so the conversation really was, well, why? Why is it producers or directors or music editors or music supervisors or whoever are making these decisions? Why is there this, this feeling out there that there, people aren't looking for melodic scores? They're looking for more ambient textural 
things. I mean, and that's that's a big conversation, but it seems like both of these conversations were happening on Facebook at the same time, which is fascinating. There's obviously there are a lot of people, and both of these people are people that are are very well entrenched in this industry, um, certainly more so than you and me. Um, but the people having these these conversations, and it's I think it's an important conversation. It's certainly an interesting one. I kind of have my own cynical theories, but it's interesting reading the the um, the perspectives of a lot of different people commenting as well. Um, do you feel like it's just a big trend, and like all trends, it'll get replaced by something else that'll upset people? Yeah, I, I do. Um, a lot of people were. You know, it, it's I think it's really easy and it's really cynical to say, oh well, you know. Kid composers these days, they just don't know how to write a good tune. I, I don't I don't buy that argument for a second. I think there are um there are numerous talented composers in Hollywood who are more than capable of writing good melodies. I mean, um you the sort of half joking well, joke about Hollywood is that, you know, welcome to Hollywood, we don't need you. I mean, there there are already plenty of talented people there. I, I don't think I don't think it has anything to do with lack of talented people. Um, I, yeah, I think it's entirely a, a trend thing. And, and basically, my opinion, what I think it, it comes down to is this. when Hans Zimmer scores one of these big two hundred million dollar movies, um, regardless of, of how his score contributes, the historical trend, aside from maybe the Lone Ranger, is that these movies go on to make a billion dollars, right? And so when someone is making their own big action movie, maybe it doesn't cost $200 million. Maybe it's a $40 million movie, but they would still like their movie to make a billion dollars as well. So it's. And they get all the people associated or Im- imitate or, or at least it, with- yeah, at least imitate it. So I think I think that's what the trend is, is that the last, you know, five, 10 years, whatever, whatever window you want to use, Hans Zimmer has been the face of really the the biggest blockbusters with you know the biggest box office incomes and i think there are a lot of people out there who just they want as much of a piece of that as they can get it so they look at those films and they say okay they have this kind of score i want my film to make a billion dollars so i want that kind of score too is and that an, is that an artistically justifiable reason no no but, it's but, completely it's completely business and money driven yeah. But, but that, that that's creates, that's that kind of how I trend seems. though. I mean, that creates the trend so that when one like Marvel comic book movie uses that approach, then the others have to get that approach more or less very similar because then the Marvel movies are a connected universe and they want all their movies to make a lot of money. Sure. And then um and then you've got, you know, ah well, you you got DC and everything. Um yeah, you know, I think the melody stuff will always I mean, it's not that that is the only way to write music. I mean, there's in a concert hall um, melodic writing also kind of phased out and then it it comes sure. back or some some people just do what they do but there was a time when everyone kind of was more or less had um subjects in their music that everyone could clearly hear and understand and then it got to be where it was like art it was it wasn't always about painting an apple and a vase yeah. and still life it was you know even in the concert hall there was um ideas and they, sometimes they were abstract and and they were still developed and kind of uh, explored sonically, but it wasn't always something concrete and recognizable um, like a boat on the on ocean waves. Anyway, so then in film music, I actually see it as very, a very similar um, trajectory, but it's interesting because it's got all sorts of like popular elements mixed in. So yeah. I thought it was kind of cool that Hans Zimmer used this nylon string or steel string guitars on Man of Steel just – Kind of was like the drumming, though, in the end. He had a whole bunch of people. They're all talented. They're all doing some potentially cool stuff. And then it all just got kind of diluted in the final mix. Like, it's all just now a bunch of sameness that's over, like, performed. It was, right. right. Um, so, anyway, um, which so, that, was, yeah, it's, it's, that, that was the very Hollywood part of that process was that it was all over budgeted and just bloated. And you could have had, like, one amazing drummer do some really cool stuff. And you didn't need twelve people doing the same marching band rhythms as we, <laughs> as we pointed out. Right. But I, I will be very interested to see, you know, in the next ten years, just does it? How much more synthesized does everything get, or 
do you know I, I don't even for me it's not even a matter of of you know synthesized versus a live orchestra for me it's more about i think kind of the musical nuts and bolts is how it, to me it really becomes a question of how many more scores do we get that are just dominated by by drones and percussion you know so like i said it was interesting to kind of read the different points of view uh that people were bringing to this conversation and everyone has their their different theories and like i said mine i think it's a lot of it is that han zimmer is the successful guy with the really expensive movies and everyone wants their movie to make a lot of money um the other the other part that i think is maybe a little bit more valid and a little less cynical than the one that i just suggested um it was about a year or so maybe a year and a half ago that you and i were interviewing lucas kendall on our show uh-huh and he brought up a really good point which is um, films nowadays, especially again, these $200 million blockbuster films, there's so much CGI and so much visual information that having a, a very rich thematic score, maybe it's maybe just from a sensory point of view, it's just too much that if you're going to have so much visual stimulation so much of, of what has kind of come to be known as pixel porn. It's just yeah. explosions and sparks and smoke and everything all over the screen all the time. Uh, if you're going to have so much visual information, maybe there's just not there's just not room for a lot of sonic information as well. Um, there, you know, there's only, kind of only so much sensory bandwidth you can expect from an audience member. Um, well, I mean, they they certainly do go overboard. I mean, if you just think about a Michael Bay Transformers movie, because um, when you see you know Optimus Prime like whip out a big fire sword and go after you know any whatever the Decepticons are that there that he's fighting, and then all of the sounds that the sound effects guys whip up, like all the sounding of the metal grinding and the transforming yeah. and the ultimate destruction and whatever going on around them, and then you got to put music in there. That if it's just chugging away, like, you know, like instant drama, just add water. You know, it's like, dun, 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 dun. Then it's like, well, that's at least one level of simplicity amidst a bunch of levels of complexity. Yeah. But and a lot of times, yeah, maybe maybe that's all that there is room for. Well, I mean, if you flip that and you just have a bunch of guys in the West on horses, that's pretty simple. And then the music, like Lone Ranger or... or um, you magnificent seven or good, yeah. bad, and ugly. Then you can actually have some really cool stuff in the music because your scenes are like dusty and sparse. Yeah. And- well, and and you know, especially when you have you know the big wide shots of someone riding across the desert, all of a sudden you have this giant panoramic that is visually it's very open. Uh huh. So that you know you can kind of put a big tune there and and it works. When you've Which got is actually three- funny because of Rango. Um, Rango is CGI. Rango's a really good example. <laughs> it's CGI, and it's got Hans Zimmer kind of ripping off himself and Ennio Morricone. And it, yeah. it, and then, of course, Los Lobos is in there with Arturo Sandoval, and that's just when it just goes over the top. And it's like, now this is just an awesome sandwich is what this right, is. Right. <laughs> um, but it's a lot of fun because then he has these like overly CGI vistas of sunsets and weird, ugly little an- animals and creatures uh, not on horseback, but they're riding like ostriches or something. It's very bizarre, but the movie has a very ugly charm to it. Anyway, but it does mix score and visuals pretty well, even though it is a Western that is all CGI. By Industrial Light and Magic, which they don't normally do complete CGI movies. They're mostly, yeah. you know, they do effects for live action. But anyway, so, well, I think we figured it out, Kevin. I think that's it. I think we just solved everybody's problems, Bill. Yeah, tune in next week. We we should we should leave our address so they know where to send the check. (laughs) I think you guys are should should be waiting for a a a phone call next year from the the prince of of Sweden or whoever does the the Nobel Prize. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know what? I'll I'll turn my ringer on right now. It's definitely yeah. You want to make sure and make sure you don't have any Swedish numbers blocked in your phone. Yeah, I should probably go plug it in. Yeah, make sure it's nice and charged, and you got the international plan. Not bad. I think that's a good way good to go. To plan ahead is what I'm saying. Just always yeah. be ready for the Swedish you know, to come calling. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Right. Yeah. I, okay. I thought so, it was an interesting conversation. Certainly not the end of the conversation, but yeah, the the point you brought up, I think that's that's really the kicker is 
how long does this continue? What's what's the next what's the next corner, you know? Yeah, and it will it will continue to be more automatable, I think, because as people can produce the scores from their computers, they're going to keep doing that. Um the musicians in Los Angeles will have to fight more and more for involvement. Um which I think they're doing steadily now anyway, but they're built into the machine of the the filmmaking process out there uh, that's not the same everywhere else. But anyway, um, and it, really it's going to come down to the composers. It's just going to be like, what do you, ladies and gentlemen, want to do when you create your scores? Do you want to just have it be completely you know, synthesized? And actually, do you want to just have bare ingredients so you don't really show that you have a mastery of music? But at the same time, you are hopefully providing what the film needs. But, you know, there's a lot less materials and there's a lot less um, technique that goes into some of it. It's, it's certainly overproduced. So 30 years ago, they couldn't make the scores like they make now, sounding-wise. But they could have made them technique-wise 30 years ago by taking away many of the elements that were in scores 30 years ago and reducing them to very simplistic cues they could easily do what they do now music wise not technology wise but um but anyway so we'll we'll see i mean technology will continue to make things easier um and and we'll just see what happens from there i'm going to try to catch tim's vermeer though i want to see that uh and i've just been really bad about most of the oscar nominated films in general i haven't had a chance to see her or or 12 years a slave but anyway um you should go out and see those movies Audience, don't let my sins be your sins. Go check out, support these um, good movies. And, um, and I imagine, I mean, this is kind of the time of year, well, right around today, which is the, the Oscars, where um, a lot of these things are, are showing back up in theaters for another week or so because right. they've been nominated for all this stuff. So if you've missed them before, now is probably yeah. your, your chance. They get the Oscar bump, and then for no good reason, there's a new R-rated version of Anchorman 2 that will come out, which I'm also maybe – Slightly thrilled about as well. But <laughs> anyway, uh, that'll do it for this episode of Streamers and Punches. Uh, you can listen to us on soundnotion.tv slash SAP, where you can subscribe to the show, leave comments, and find links to the music we spoke about and the articles and the other Facebook things and so on and so forth. You can also subscribe through iTunes. My name is Bill Witham. And I am Kevin Wilt. And thank you for listening. <laughs>